HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. You can get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. We are thrilled and honored that this podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for small business entrepreneurs and sales professionals. From MSNBC's Your Business to Inc.com to Fit Small Business, Proven, uh, there's just a whole host of sites that are including Accelerate Your Business Growth on their list of the best podcasts to listen to. That is largely due to the guests that I have uh, the pleasure and honor of speaking with and have over the years. Um, These are folks who have expertise in an area that is relevant to business and they give of their time and their knowledge to come on and have a conversation with me so that you folks in the audience can do better things in your business um, by using that information. And today is no different Today we have such a person with us, and our guest is actually Joel Schwartzberg, currently the Senior Director of Strategic and Executive Communications for a major nonprofit organization. Joel has been teaching effective presentation and messaging techniques to corporate, group, and individual clients since 2006, and is the author of Get to the Point, Sharpen Your Message and Make Your Words Matter, which was released in October. His clients include American Express, Comedy Central, Blue Apron, the American Jewish Committee, and the Brennan Center for Justice. As a public speaking competitor, Joel won the 1990 United States Championship in After Dinner Speaking, the 1990 Massachusetts State Championship in Persuasive Speaking, and that same year was ranked among the top 10 public speakers in the country. After coaching public speaking forensics teams at the University of Pennsylvania, Seton Hall University, St. Joseph's University, and the City University of New York, 
Joel was inducted into the National Forensic Association Hall of Fame in 2002. Joel's given public speaking presentations at annual conferences, including the Reagan Leadership and Executive Communication Conference and the ALI Leadership and Executive Communication Conference. Thank you so much for joining me today, Joel. Thank you, Diane. It's my pleasure. And as you were saying that, I was thinking I must be about 125 years old to <laughs> capture all of that activity. I was sort of um, amazed myself that I was able to get it in. I think mostly it's because I don't golf. So uh -huh. I have that there kind of go. free time <laughs> to explore all these ideas with point and speech making. Yeah, and I have to tell you that I thought it was really interesting to read that you um, – we're inducted into the National Forensic Association Hall of Fame. That's cool, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I really enjoy that, and it's got to be because of how effective you were with uh, train, you know, coaching those folks on uh, their public speaking skills. Yeah, it was a very. It's based on my experience as a competitor, and this is in college. Although I actually began my competitive experience in sixth grade, so I did it for about eleven years consecutively, and then I turned around and was a coach for those universities and colleges you mentioned. So that distinction of being in the Hall of Fame really goes towards someone who made an overall contribution to what we call forensics. I see. It's really great. Um, now. I mentioned in your bio that your book is titled Get to the Point, so I actually want to start there, and I would love it if you would explain to my listeners, um, what is a real point? All right, and that's a critical question, because in truth, that's the ball game right there. Did I make my point, or did I not make my point? And most people... And most speakers don't know what a point is. They confuse a point with a theme or an idea or a topic or a title, things that are much thinner and much more shallow than an actual point. Because to answer your question, a point is an argument you make, not an argument like a Thanksgiving argument, <laughs> but a proposition of value that you want to and have the opportunity to prove, provide evidence for, provide reasoning for. It should have a reasonable counterpoint so you could spend some time developing it and making your case. And that sounds like, oh, that's only for litigators or politicians. But every one of us, when we open our mouth and our intention is to impact another person, there is an opportunity to make a point. And that moment is often wasted because people, like I said, uh, get confused. I often call it the most misunderstood and missed and muffed idea in all of communication, what a point is. And in this book, which is very short and to the point, and it should be, I actually have a test, a very easy test and a multi-part test that people can go through and put there what they conceive as their point. They sort of put it through this car wash <laughs> that helps people understand, A, is it a real point? And B, have I made it the strongest and sharpest point it can possibly be? Oh, I just love that. As you were explaining it, I unfortunately was thinking about speak, people who I've heard do workshops or some sort of lengthy presentation where there's a worksheet and everything, but there's mm -hmm. never a point. There's right. never, right? There's no connectivity. There's no... Uh, I, I leave there with, okay, I just did not learn a thing. I have no idea right. how to do, be better at fill in the blank, whatever. Right. The subject There's is. a vague notion. And in fact, if you ask those people before they give those presentations, what is your point? They'll often say something like social media or research and development or product innovation. But none of those things I just said are points because you're not telling me how do you feel about pro project innovation? What is the role of research and development? What are you trying, what piece of value are you trying to convey to me so that I can get on board or feel excited about it or buy your product? You're just giving me a, an atmospheric almost theme, but you're not telling me what proposition you're making. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So I, I'd like to segue a little bit from that and talk mm -hmm. some about email and sure. making getting your point across in email 
because I think many people don't do that either. <laughs> um, right. I mean, we often think, oh, this is only about public speaking, but it's all right. these avenues of communication. And what do we do most often? We email. So I published an article recently in Fast Company, which, which took these ideas about making a point, and this is in the book also, but apply it to email because that's a place where we're burying our points all the time. And it really starts at the subject line. How often have you been part of a thread that was like re, 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 Wednesday, and, and within that strange and non-telling notion, you're trying to make this, you're trying to pass along this great idea you had in the morning about moving your small company forward, or a point about true entrepreneurship or your core values. How is that captured under a title like re, 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 re last Thursday? So one thing I coach people is to always make sure your subject line really reflects the point you're trying to make. And in fact, not to be afraid in the middle of a thread, if you have a brand new idea or are taking it in a new direction, don't feel like that subject line is locked in. You know as well as anyone, you can change that. So why don't you? Because that's the front door through which people are going to understand the point you're trying to make. So it really starts there. And the rest of the ideas focus on putting your point up front and using some of the trainings that I talk about in the book to make your point clearly, using things like bullets, because bullets direct the reader's attention toward the main things you want to talk about or the main points you're trying to make. And also, I generally say I, I break paragraphs all the time. I rarely have a paragraph longer than three sentences. Sometimes they're two or even one sentence. And that's just more easily consumable. Nothing makes me not want to read than huge paragraphs of text, 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 especially when behind them is only this one point. Do you buy into this idea? Yet I see so much tech there, it's almost biblical, <laughs> that I don't want to wade through it. You right. know, I need, I need a machete for that thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, uh, and, it hap and that, I, I have to tell you that if I open up an email and it's long, I'll mark it as unread and close it because right. chances are good. I don't even think my brain could absorb having to try and read all of that in that moment. And so the, the, if there is a point somewhere in there, it's totally lost. Or, right. you know, it has no urgency to it because it's, you know, so if it's even in there anywhere, it's got to be buried. Right. And then there are several peripheral things. Like I always recommend people say, hi, comma, hello, comma, hello, Mary, or hey, team, because that's a sort of welcoming invitation. If someone says yeah. that to you personally, you're more likely going to be engaged. So why skip that moment? And the other important thing about email is thank yous. Like often uh, your direct report or a partner or a vendor does a great job and you write to them, great job or thanks. That communicates very little. In fact, some of those words are what I call adjectives, a word like great or very good or excellent. That's so bland and general and generic. There's no meaning attached to it. It's Then the burden falls on the reader or the listener to attach their own meaning to it. So if you're thanking someone for something or if you're saying good work, the best thing you can do is say why. You did a great job on that project because your commitment really came through. Or I thank you for being our partner because our collaboration and our combining of talents is really what's going to elevate this project and earn us a lot of money. Uh, this is really so valuable um, because it really is about what's your intention. Right. If your intention is to convey thanks, then there's got to be substance to it in order for right. it to actually have an impact. Right. Yeah. And, and the more details you add to it, the better the impact is going to be. You know, just put yourself in the shoes of someone receiving that email. My direct reports uh, would feel the same way if I did from my boss to say thank you for these very specific things you did that really made an impact in our overall goals and objectives. I mean, yeah. you can just tell if you receive that, you know how much more of an impact that would have on you than just a simple great job. Absolutely. And and I, I guess, I mean, my my assumption is that either people don't want to take the time, you know, they're racing through everything they're doing, or they're thinking that they don't need to be doing that, that people should know. Right. Right? It, it's this That it counts course. for something. Right. Yeah. That's like, that's just like saying if I asked you what the point of your presentation was and you said innovation, that's a short 
way of saying nothing, really, because yeah. you're not telling me what's the point you're trying to make about innovation, what argument right. you're trying to make. So I don't think it's, I mean, sometimes it's laziness, but often people just don't know the difference between a conveyance that has true impact and a conveyance that's actually fairly meaningless. Yeah. Well, that's why we're talking about it, right? We're going to get rid of the right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you know, one of the, um, so the first, when I started coaching public speaking in 2006, there wasn't much about making your point. So what I realized was I was coaching public speakers to be stronger and more effective in their gestures and their eye contact and the way they move their feet and sometimes their speech organization, their volume, their pausing, all the stuff that we can read from a million resources on the web and elsewhere. And what happened was when I would ask them what their point was, or sometimes they understood that to be a thesis, they didn't really have one. And when I realized there was sort of a an opportunity there and a vacuum, something so critical, that's when I really sat down and looked over my whole experience in communications and tried to create a test so that people can apply sort of a litmus test to what they think is their point. And the most basic form of that test is called the I believe that test. And my wife, who's a fifth grade teacher, uses it with her kids also when they're developing reports because it's so simple. It basically goes like this. Take what you think is your point that you want to make and put the words, I believe that, in front of it. If it is a grammatically correct sentence, if it's a complete thought, if your fourth grade teacher would say, all right, that is <laughs> you know, a grammatically correct sentence, then you're well on your way to a point. But if it doesn't make a complete sense, and if it is not a complete thought, then you really need to reimagine it. So you can't say, for example, I believe that revenue, or I believe that social media, <laughs> or I believe that greatness, or I believe that the improvement in our HR team. Those are not complete sentences. They all fail the I believe that test. Yeah. So you're not actually on your way to a point when you say, I believe that an elevation of the exposure of our HR team will help us elevate our entire staff. Now you're making an argument or you're on your way to making a, a true argument that you could spend, you could actually visualize the way you're going to compose that argument. And you can visualize the impact you want to have on people, what piece of value they're going to take away from it. So that's really the first level of the test, but it goes a long way and it really helps people get on the road to making a point. I think that's great. That is great. I think that is tremendously valuable and people should be doing that because it will help them realize whatever they're putting together isn't doing anything. Feels good. You know, it feels good to stand up in front of, well, for many people, stand up in front of a, a bunch of people. But if they leave not knowing what they just spent their time doing, then right. it's, you know, an epic fail. Yeah. yeah. I work with uh, salespeople sometimes. They're my clients. And often what they do is they give book reports. So they tell me about their inventory. I would say, I remember one client, she created um, mugs and brochures and pins and those kind of goods with your logo on it. And I said, give me your best sales pitch for it. She said, okay, so look at this brochure. See how shiny it is. It won't get wet. Your logo can go three color on both sides. And look at this pin. This pin is made of a special nanotechnology. It'll pierce your clothes, but it won't pierce your skin. And your logo can go all over. And she kind of went through all the products that way. And I said, are you done? She said, I'm done. I told you about all of my products. And I said, you know what I never heard you say? I never heard you say that if I buy your products, they will make me more successful. Yeah. That I will make more money using your products or that my brand will be seen by more people if I use your products. She didn't never even came close to that because she was yeah. giving me a book report on all those things. Yeah. And I believe that helps you get to that because she would realize she can't say, I believe that the quality of this paper. Right. Right. Yeah. These are great examples. I really appreciate it because, boy, it just makes it so clear. And I, I fear that some of my listeners are cringing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Everyone does a double take. Right Wait a minute. Yeah. Right. right. I've been doing that. But this is great because you're absolutely right. I try and talk to people about 
value, you know, like when you're doing your 30 second introduction, what is the value? What is the result? And they do that book report thing. They do this and it's like, no, I really don't care. You know, I've started right. saying to them, guess what? Nobody cares about that. Like they're not even going to care right. about it later when they know it's going to help them make more money because that's all they care about. So. Right. And I see it in my day job all the time. I have direct reports coming to me, giving me a status report on what's going on in their world. But then I turn around to them and I say, that's great. What's your recommendation? What do you propose? And in so doing, it's actually a strong professional development opportunity because I'm training them to say, all right, here's what's going on. Here's what I propose. Here's what I recommend. That's a leadership skill. Absolutely. And that's how you get people to moving into a point. I also uh, help out with some of our eternal events, town halls. We've all sat through these sort of town halls or presentations if you're part of a corporation or a company. And often they are these book reports. Here's what our numbers are. Here are the places we're going to be developing our content or developing new stores. Here's our forecast for the future. Thank you very much. Sit down. But they never say, because of all this, I believe that we are going to make more money. I believe that more people are going to find out about us. And if you're in a nonprofit, I believe that we're going to save more lives. I believe that we're going to help our world become more environmentally safe. Whatever your highest value is, that's the opportunity you have to connect your work to the highest value that your operation can have on society. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Now, you right. say that <laughs> – I just have so many things to ask you. <laughs> you say that um, – Writing a speech word for word is a bad idea, and I am curious about why you think that. Right. The number one reason it's a bad idea is because it focuses you on the words. And you've created something where you say to yourself, all right, well, if I read this word one to re word 735, I will be successful. But if I say the wrong words, I might not be as successful. <laughs> But at the end of the day, you and I know, and most people know, what do you get from a presentation? You're going to remember two or three things at the most if the speaker does his or her job right. And the things they get are not words, not pithy collections of five precisely arranged words. They're going to get your point. So what I want people to focus on when they're giving a presentation is what is my point? What are my sub points? What's my evidence or reasoning that leads me to my point? And that's not about the words. So no one sets out to think, what are the first 12 words I want to say, or, or those kind of things. That's the first reason. Another reason I don't like people going up with word for word speeches is if you get lost, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because you don't know what your next point is. You just got lost between words 72 and 73. How are you going to find that place again? Yeah. And then the final reason people shouldn't write their speech is because you're focusing too much on that script, unless you memorize it, which I don't recommend for anyone because it's fraught with peril and it takes a lot of time. And so what you're doing is reading something to your audience, and that is antithetical to true public speaking. Public speaking is about you having a point, conveying that effectively to your audience, not you reading words to your audience. If you were doing that, you might as well email them the script. So we try to, and I've really evangelized this at my organization, we really try to break people from scripts, not have them focus on words, focus their point, bring a few notes up so they can remind themselves of the key things they want to say, but no complete sentences, because then you're reading to your audience, then you're focusing too much on the words and not enough on what they will retain, which is your point. I just, I'm loving this. This makes so much sense to me. Um, it's really incredible. Now, um, so you, you said, you know, you can take some notes up with you, but so what does a good note look like? Cause I can see people writing their entire thing on three by five right. cards, right? Right. Like old school, we used to see on television, you bring up 13 cards and you yeah. go through them one by one. Yep. Um, well that's, that's old school for a reason. What I recommend, you know, sometimes I have people think of a band's set list. So you can imagine that in your mind, all right, these are the songs we're going to go through in this order, but it's written out so we don't forget which song is number four and which song is number seven. Now think of those songs as your points. So you want to create a little roadmap of your, for yourself. So let's say you blank out between your second and your third sub point. 
You just look down at your notes. Oh, that's what I'm going to say next. You look up again, and then you begin from there. So your notes are really to remind you of anything that's critical as well as anything you might forget. So let's say you forget a name or a date or a statistic or an article out of the New York Times. You want to put some scratch notes in there to remind yourself. Now, those notes should be such shorthand that if I looked at your notes, it should make no sense to me. In fact, when I run my workshops, I have everyone show me their notes. And if I could give their speech with their notes, I have them rewrite them so that they're gobbledygook when I see them again. <laughs> because it should be complete shorthand. It's like you're studying for that test in high school. It should almost make no sense, but, but for you, what, what you've written on the back of your hand. And then you know that that's guiding you. And then the only other thing I say about notes is sometimes people read into their notes. But as long as you're looking at your audience and using your notes only as reference, then your audience won't remember you looking down. They'll remember you looking down and reading into your notes. But you know what? Your notes don't really care too much about what you're saying. Only your audience does. Yeah. So you want to look down at your notes, remind yourself, then look up, and then give it to your audience. And the, the funny thing is when people have done that with their notes, I'll often ask the audience, how many times do you think Sarah looked down at her notes? And they'll say – once or twice. And the truth is it's more like seven or eight times, but because she didn't draw attention to it, nobody remembers that because it's a non moment. They only remember the parts when there's natural conveyance going on. So I've been just telling you, this makes so much sense to me because as you're talking about it, I'm thinking, I'm like thinking about people who um, maybe aren't really comfortable public speakers. And so you know, they may be thinking to themselves, yeah, right, but I really need to to have it all down. But then I keep coming back to your point, your main point, which is have a point, um, because I think anybody, if they know what their point is, right, then they can talk about it, right? It's not something right. They can talk around it because they are they are an yeah. expert in their point. We're going to assume that because they're in that yeah. position, they got there, they were promoted or what have you. So they can explain that point. But if you don't have that point, then you have a vacuum. And what would people naturally fill that blank space with? Words. Words. Because they don't know their point. Yeah. What happens when you don't have a point? You're pointless. And who wants to be that? Yeah. <laughs> so I really encourage people to sort of break out of it. Now, some people are like, but I have to write it. I have to write it, Joel. I'm, I'm, it would make me crazy not to write it out. So I said, all right, write it out. Let's meet again tomorrow. And we meet again, they wrote it out, and then we transfer that manuscript. We pretend like that was in their head. We turn that into notes because we don't want someone bringing a manuscript up to the lectern. Yeah. We want someone to bring notes. So they transfer it to notes. I say, are these, does these notes represent everything you need to say from that manuscript? Will these notes jog your memory or prompt you to say everything you need to say? They say, yes. Then we burn the manuscript. <laughs> oh, that's so great. That's a great ritual. I keep thinking about, are you familiar with, um, how do they pronounce it, Picha Pucha? Picha Pucha? I'm afraid not, but I'm very intrigued. <laughs> I know. See, this will be, you'll love it. Well, maybe you'll love it. I don't know. Well, so it's 20 slides, 20 seconds each, hmm. and you have to tell a story. Like, there's a theme hmm. to mm -hmm. whatever. And people have to, they pick their pictures, but they have no control over them. So you turn your pictures in in order, like you number them. And then mm. the, the people who run the thing actually put your slides up and they're timed at 20 seconds a slide. So, mm. and you should have a point. And so <laughs> when right. you do this thing, you're trying to make sure that you're staying on the slide. You know, that whatever you're talking about is the same thing that the slide is about. Um, and I did it for locally, the topic was tell your story. And I have mm -hmm. to tell you that at first it was one of the hardest things because it's only seven minutes. Right. It's one of the hardest things that I ever did. It was also one of the scariest things I ever did. And I do public speaking all the time. Hmm. It doesn't bother me one bit. Um, but it, it was really impactful because you are really forced to – Stay on topic, have a thread, have some sort of marker. And maybe because I speak all the time, I didn't take any notes up with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about it. I just had to make sure I knew my story and the point that I wanted to get across right. about, you know, what my actual story was about. And I got done. And so I have those people who are like, 
you didn't even take any notes. I'm like, I didn't think we could. Right, right. I you know, wasn't even in my yeah, head. Yeah, you knew what you meant to say. Yeah, and you yeah. knew what you meant to leave your audience with. And um, I'm not sure if you're, if you've been part of a Toastmasters group. You probably know a little bit about Toastmasters. Maybe you know a lot. But it's this international organization of public speaking. And one of the things they do chapter by chapter across the world is something called table topics, where you pick a topic and you have to speak on it immediately for two to three minutes. Wow. And often the table topic will say something like, name a painful childhood experience. And then people will tell the story or they'll talk off the cuff, sort of randomly stream of consciousness about a childhood experience. But the the best way to do it is to approach that and think, well, what was the learning? What was the point of that experience? So for my children, one thing I hope they got through school was accountability. So you'd want to take a topic like that and talk about, you know, when I went to school, I wasn't very responsible for what I needed to do. But you know what? Accountability is so important and so important to be developed at a young age. And let's talk about why and the benefits of being accountable. Now you have something that you can express. And not only that, but you're leaving your audience with something of value. Yeah. We often talk about, you know, uh, what do they get from your speech? What's in it for them? And Ideally, in all of your presentations, you're presenting a piece of value they could take with them and something they can chew on and play with. Yeah. And you should always think about that. When you're yeah, playing. because yeah. at the end of the day, it's not what you say. It's what they retain. And I always say your number one job is to get that idea from your head to your audience, whether it's through email, through a speech or through a message or a memo. And if they received it successfully, that's the ball game right there. And what's interesting about that setup is when people tell me they're nervous, I often talk about that as a way to mitigate their nervousness. Because why are we nervous if we're giving a speech, for example? We're nervous because everyone's looking at me. What does my shirt look like? <laughs> are my teeth white enough? I'm out here all alone. Everyone's staring at me. And what helps them being less nervous is realizing is it's not about you. This isn't a fashion competition. This isn't a beauty contest. This is about that thing next to you, your point. This is what you developed. And like a messenger, like a bicycle messenger, your job is to take that point, that thing, and move it from there next to you or in your head, move it successfully to their minds. So it's not about you. You are the vehicle, the very qualified vehicle, through which that thing of value travels. But sometimes that makes people feel less spotlighted and less viewed because now it's really about this other thing that right. they and only they can move. Yeah. It's about the information, not the... Right. Not, not about them. them. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I have to take a quick sponsor break. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall, The Go-Giver by Bob Berg, and Get to the Point by Joel <laughs> Schwartzberg. <laughs> I love that. My one, favorite. You know, right? <laughs> I know, right. So uh, all of whom have been guests on this podcast. So visit mm -hmm. audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Joel Schwartzberg about effective public speaking and communication. So... I mentioned before the sponsor break that I had done this thing um, and, and the topic was actually uh, tell us your story. Mm -hmm. but I'm wondering for, for people, we hear that storytelling is a really mm -hmm. good way to get a point across. So what's the best way to tell a story in a speech? So the best way, and, and I agree, and it's, it's not only in vogue, and it certainly is, because there are entire conferences devoted to storytelling. There are entire books now devoted to storytelling. And it's true that an, an audience will pay more attention to a story, especially a detailed story, especially a personal story, than they will pure exposition. But here's the really crucial thing. The story does not move your point. 
you use the story as a vehicle to move your point. So in other words, if I tell a story about the Halloween costume I wore when I was 12 years old, and I just end with that story, the audience hasn't learned anything until I say that story illustrates the importance of developing creativity in young people. You need to say those words. Hmm. This story is an example of how we're going to elevate and evolve as an, exor- as an organization, where the person in this story really reflects the kind of commitment to mission that we're looking to elevate amongst our staff. So really it's about the story is great, but the obligation after the story is to explain why that story is relevant. You need to extract the point from that story and then deliver that point to your audience. Because if you don't, all all the audience is going to be left with is an engaging story. They might even remember the story. Yeah. But they'll only remember the story and not the point connected to it. Hmm. That's interesting. I get it. It's interesting. I never would have thought of it because we do think when we tell the story that people are going to connect the dots and the light bulb is going to go off. Right. And you're right. And what you just described is what happens. You know, you're the speaker. It's your job to move that point. But yet what you've done is put something out there and transferred the burden to your audience yeah. to make sense of that to attach their own relevance to it, because for some reason you didn't do that job. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. okay, I got it. So, um, I want to ask- You know, and the same is true, by the way, for when I talk about PowerPoint with my clients or in the book, mm-hmm. I talk about that idea behind the slides also. Because sometimes we'll see a slide that says, all right, well, last year, our percentage increase was this, and this year our percentage increase is this. And then they move on to the next slide. (laughs) But really they're still relying on the audience to put that into some kind of context. It's the speakers, the communicators responsibility to say, here's what that means. Here's what that tells us. Here's how we're gonna learn from that and profit from that. And that burden should always be on the speaker because that's when you're giving the key value. The key value isn't just that our profit increased year over year, but what that means for the organization and what opportunities that creates for your listeners. Okay, so in that case, um, if we talked about, I can take that right back around to the the whole (laughs) point of this, which in that case it would be, what is the point, right? What is the point Mm -hmm. of this information? Why are you sharing this information? What do you want your audience to take away, right? It's not just the information, it's the impact of it. Right, right. But often we think, and very often we think, it is the information. Because we don't, that's where it comes back to, we don't know this sort of realm of a point. We're not familiar with what a point is. We think the information is the point. Yeah. Just like that example I gave of the person who made all of that inventory. She thought her inventory was the point. Yeah. And left a big hole there for her actual point. Got it. Got it. That makes perfect sense to me. So why is it, this is sort of a combination question, because there's Mm -hmm. people who are afraid of public speaking, there's people who when they Mm -hmm. do it, they ramble, and there's Mm -hmm. people who don't necessarily know how to even start a presentation. So Mm -hmm. what's going on there? Is it because they don't have a point or, you know, what, what is happening? It's a common, you know. If I had to focus someone on one thing, it would definitely always be about the point. In fact, I get a variety of questions. How should I start? What should I do at the end? These kind of things. And my answer is always the point, the point, the point. What do you do at the beginning? You want to get your point across. What do you do at the end? You want to get, you know, re-solidify or re-impress upon your audience the point you're making. Because often audiences, they'll remember the first thing you said and even more so the last thing you said. Mm -hmm. So if your point is really the one thing you want to get across, use those opportunities to do that. The other trap I think people get into is this idea, we know that less is more. That means if we cut words or we make something shorter, it's probably a good thing. But what I want to really impress upon people is that more is less. You actually lose when you add things to your point. And sometimes I call this split ends. When someone comes to me with an I believe that, and it's I believe we should be more professional, effective, efficient, and productive. 
what happens there is in their mind, they're thinking, all right, I'm adding more words, so I'm adding value to it, like how you would add to your home. You're going to add value to it by all these extensions. But what's happening there? Every time you add a word, they're fighting with each other, and you actually dilute the impact of each of those words by the fact that you're throwing more out there. Imagine if you said 17 adjectives. Well, you know then it would be a mess because not only would you you know, have to judge each one of those 17 things, but you're given no information and no hint as to which one is most important. So people should realize more is less, and it's better to say this opportunity will make us more efficient. That will have more impact than efficient and productive and effective. Now, those are all different things, and you may want to get to those things, but put them in their own moment and compartmentalize those things. So first, I'm going to talk about why this makes us more efficient, and then after that, I'm going to talk about how it's going to make us more effective. I see. So you give them their own platform or their own – Right, their platform. own platform, correct. Yeah. But don't crowd them into a sentence. Don't jam yeah. your point with as many trimmings because you think, oh, I'm, I'm adding more. Because yeah. I'm adding more, my audience will get more. Well, that's not really true. In fact, the audience cannot process things at the speed or with the efficiency with which you can say them. I often say that it takes an audience twice as long to hear what you're saying as it takes you to say it. Huh. And that's pretty much true across the board. So you need to make it simple for them, but it's also to your benefit to make it simple for them, one idea at a time. That's fabulous. Okay. So who are some of your favorite point makers? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I look to the, uh, the people that I see on television, and I think uh, President Reagan was a, a good point maker. Yeah. I think President Obama was a good uh, point maker. I think... Um, President Obama's wife, when she gave a presentation at the Democratic National Convention, Michelle Obama, that was, I think that's my favorite speech of all time. Huh. When, she ta when she talked about um, that there were slaves at the White House and she connected her personal history to this imperative. And it was very clear. It was very simple. And I recently went to a conference. I forget her name, but she has a speechwriter who goes out there and appears at a lot of conferences and talks about this. But it was one of the most clear and impactful points that I've ever heard from a politician or anyone. Uh, sometimes at the Academy Awards, I'll see good presentations versus bad ones. And it really depends. I try to keep my, uh, my eyes open to all those opportunities. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. It's got to be, um, you, you must be really keyed into it. I would think that, that when you're anywhere and you're listening to people communicate, you're asking yourself the question. How right, and I'm, I'm thinking, what am I receiving as an audience? In fact, in the book, I talk about uh, two of my favorite speeches, and one was by Taylor Swift in 2016, and actually the other one was my least favorite speech, and that was also in 2016 by Denzel Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and what um, what Taylor Swift does, and she did this recently when she was giving congressional testimony, not congressional, but she was giving testimony in a trial recently, she made a very clear point about what it takes for young women to get their voice out there and what they need to avoid and not pay attention to in order to succeed. And people talked about her moment. She was winning the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. This was 2016. And in the book, I actually reprint it in its entirety. And it's such a tight, focused, clear point. There's no question about from the audience point of view what she was trying to communicate to them and what they got from her. As opposed to Denzel Washington, who I don't want to get too much into it because he has given successful speeches before. But when he won the Cecil B. DeMille Award, he had months to prepare for that. And, and boy, was that a hot mess. It was just he didn't bring his speech up and he thanked people and he wasn't sure what he wanted to say and lost his place. And I only offer it not to slam on Denzel. I'm a big fan of Denzel Washington. But it's a very good example of what it looks like when you do not have a point at all and the tragedy that occurs as a result. Yeah. Is it possible that someone can have too much time to prepare 
a speech or a presentation, sales pitch, you know, whatever it is? I think it is if you take the wrong route. So with a lot of time, sometimes what you feel like is, oh, now I have the time to write this out word for word. And now I'm going to show it to my friends and I'm going to read it out. And, oh, no, you know what would be a better word here? This word versus that word. Not knowing that the audience is never going to remember either one of those words. So often it's better to have a little less time for you to say to yourself, all right, well, what's the one thing I want to get across? If the audience can only take away one thing, what would that be? And then build your presentation around that. And that's for everything. You could be giving a keynote or you could be introducing a speaker at a conference. Sometimes people say to me, well, that person doesn't have a point because they're just serving a very basic conference role. And I would say, no, that person's job is to explain why that speaker is going to be beneficial for that audience. Why did you choose that speaker? Our next speaker is really going to help us explore X, Y, Z, and I hope will make us realize that A, B, C. And that's a very clear point. Yes. Yes. I also, you know, on the focus of timing, sometimes mm -hmm. I work closely with the CEO of our organization, and he'll say, he'll sometimes express a worry about going too short. And I never, I always tell people, never worry about that. Just worry about this one thing. Did I make my point? as successfully and as effectively as I can. And if you did, you probably, nine times out of 10, maybe even 10 times out of 10, you'll fit within the time range they gave you. It's a little bit of magic, but I give a presentation that there's a three hour version, a two hour version, and a one hour version. And I don't write it out. I just feel the flow of the audience. And I feel like whenever I get, whenever I've successfully relayed my point, my time is up or there's a little time left for Q&A. But never worry about going too short if you've effectively made your point because that is the goal, not to hit seven minutes per se. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. It's funny because I was just going to ask you about that. That's one of the things that I struggle with because I am a succinct thinker, so mm -hmm. I don't embellish a lot. And mm -hmm. when I – when someone says to me, you have an hour to give this right. presentation, I'm thinking, you know what? If I can't get my point across in 30 minutes, we're all going to have a really big problem. And so I'm always going short, and, and yeah. which I think is surprising to people. But so I'm glad to hear that shorter is okay as long as you're getting your point across. Yeah, I think it's fine. Sometimes even in my workshops, uh, I'll end short. And I say to my audience, you know, I've – I've expressed all the ways I feel like you can utilize to make yourself stronger uh, conveyors of your own points and stronger champions of your own ideas. I'm happy to use this time for q and I'm happy to spend this time for you to come up to me and ask me questions or post scenarios. But, you know, when you've made your point, you've made your point. I often tell people here, the executives here, get in and then get out. Because once you've made your point, if you add layers to that mm -hmm. to pad yourself and make more time, you're actually defeating your purpose because, again, you're diluting yeah. that point by now adding other concepts to it. Yeah, I got it. This is so great. I, I really appreciate you um, coming on and sharing this information because it, it's so important and it makes so much sense. And I think it's liberating. I know it's liberating mm -hmm. for me. I firmly believe it's going to be liberating for the people who listen to this podcast. So would you share with my listeners how they can get the book, you know, what, how they can find you, whatever you um, think they should know? Sure. And, you know, I, know if you, I don't know if you can tell this from my voice, but I love sharing this information. When I was competing and I came out of competing, there's nothing I wanted to do more than share everything I've learned with other people. And I get great joy out of helping people be stronger champions of their points. So I'd love for people to get in touch with me to learn about the book. And the best way they can do that is basically to go to www.joelschwartzberg.net. That's J O E L S C H W A R T Z B E R G dot net. And there you can learn about more about my workshop. You could learn about the book. You could see people talking about the book. You could see testimonials about the workshop and things, see the things I've published. So it's a great way to not only get in touch with me, but also get a little more background on these ideas and the avenues through which I try to convey them. That's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your information with us. I would also like to thank our listeners and our sponsor, 
Remember to visit audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up for a free trial of audible.com and get a free audio book at that time. And don't forget that Joel's book is on Audible. So Mm -hmm. if you prefer to listen to books, there you go. Continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Hey friends, this is Jim Knight, former 21-year Hard Rock executive turned best-selling author and top 10 keynote speaker. And I'm Brant Menzwar, former frontman of Hollywood's most dangerous band turned top 10 motivational speaker and best-selling author. We host the how-to podcast, Thoughts That Rock, where we talk to rock stars, athletes, CEOs, astronauts, and even next door neighbors who share their expertise and opinions. Together, we tackle the most interesting and challenging topics of today. Whether you want to learn how to become more confident, how to deal with anxiety at work, or how to write a hit song, or use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in life, we've got hundreds of episodes to help amp up your life and move you forward. Subscribe to Thoughts That Rock wherever you listen to podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com for more information.